The best example of the force of focus comes from a football game between Harvard and Yale in 1968. And generally, Harvard and Yale, not very good at football, at least not in the sense of Division I Michigan type stuff. But in this year, they were both 8 0. So it was a big game. They're both undefeated going into this game. And Yale goes up 22 to 0 to start the game, partly on the strength of their quarterback. They had a quarterback named Brian Dowling, who was just a winner. He had not lost a football game since the seventh grade. He was actually immortalized in a Doonesbury cartoon. So Gary Trudeau is actually at Yale at the time this game is going on. And he uses Brian Dowling, this ultimate jock, as an inspiration for this cartoon. So if you ever read Doonesbury, you see a Yale person, 10 number on their chest, Yale helmet on their head. That's Brian Dowling. So they have Brian Dowling. They also have Kelvin Hill, who Kelvin Hill did something really rare for Yale graduates, which is he went on to the NFL. So is anyone from Yale in the audience? Right. So you end up at the University of Michigan Law School, not in the NFL. Uh, <laughs> Kelvin Hill took a little different path. And what's interesting about Kelvin Hill, not just that he was a really good football player, but he was actually the father of a superstar athlete. Grant Hill. So Grant Hill was a champion college basketball player at Duke. He was also, for those of you who are Pistons fans, an all-star with the Detroit Pistons. But Grant Hill's best, I think, accomplishment was actually with his father. They won an ugly sweater contest. <laughs> so they have Brian Dowling. They have got Kelvin Hill. And they also have a guy named Bob Levin. So Bob Levin is interesting for this reason. During college, he had a romance with a Hollywood star. He actually dated Meryl Streep, right? So you can learn about all this. It's a fascinating game. It's a wonderful documentary about this game. So on Harvard's side, they also had a Hollywood connection. So Miss Vitali, do you recognize this guy? No. So I'll give you a little help. So I talked before about Bill Clinton at the Golden Globes, he was introducing a movie called Lincoln. This guy is actually in the movie. He's Thaddeus Stevens, or this might help you out. Now do you recognize him? Yes. Who is he? I don't know, but he was. But you recognize his face. He's yeah. Tommy Lee Jones. So Tommy Lee Jones was actually an offensive lineman on Harvard's football team. Which gives you a sense of the difference between 1968 football and 2014 football, because that guy does not look anything like the Michigan offensive line. Um, but Tommy Lee Jones also had a sort of kind of relationship. Uh, it's not necessarily a love relationship. We'll call it more of a bromance in college. Because Miss Vitali, do you know who his college roommate was? No. <laughs> do you know who that guy is? No. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so Ms. Vitaly, that's El Gore. Okay. El Gore and uh, Tommy Lee Jones were actually roommates in college. There was also another sort of White House connection during this game. So on Yale's side, there was a guy named Ted Livingston, who that's not actually Ted Livingston. Um, it's just a picture of an old football game that I thought might look like Ted Livingston. But Ted Livingston's roommate was someone, and Miss McTally, I'm hoping you know this guy. Yes. <laughs> Who's that guy? That is George W. So Bush. So you're actually revealing your political affiliations right now. <laughs> you don't know Al Gore, but you do know George Bush. Right. So Al Gore is the roommate of Tommy Lee Jones. George Bush, the roommate of Bob Livingston on the Yale side. So one way to think about this game, Yale versus Harvard, was actually Bush v. Gore. <laughs> In a really important respect, the game ended in a tie. So it starts out 22-0. It goes to, at halftime, 22-6. In the fourth quarter, it's 29-13 Yale with 42 seconds left. It's still 29-13 Yale. Harvard scores a touchdown, gets a two-point conversion, gets an onside kick, scores a touchdown, gets another two-point conversion. The game ends. 29-29. It is Bush v. Gore. It's a tie. So your job right now, write the headline.
write the headline in the Harvard Crimson, knowing what Mr. Jordan told us about the really wonderful headline in the Detroit Free Press. Is this a bitter tie? Is this a thrilling tie? And so in your head, or if you have a piece of paper, really try and write this headline. Because one of the things with writing, you can't just watch it. You actually have to try and do it. So just take a couple minutes, see what would happen if you were the editor of the Harvard Crimson, and you were given the task of creating a, a headline to, as Mr. Jordan said, make order out of this chaos. All right, all right. So, Mr. Lewis, I'm not going to actually ask you for your headline, because I know it's tough to write under pressure, but what I am going to ask you to do is talk through with me some headlines that people have come up with in the past. We're going to talk about what's good about them. So the first headline could read what? Harvard comeback stuns Yale. What's good about that force of focus move? Uh, places it on Harvard and actually coming back. Yeah, so you have this game where you could imagine talking about Yale's collapse. But we want to say, no, no, no. Look at the wonderful end of the game. Because another way of thinking about it is, for most of this game, Harvard was really bad. But we, what we want to focus on in the headline is the comeback. That's really good. How about this one? This one's even better. Read this. Thrilling fourth quarter rally preserves undefeated season. What's wonderful about that end, the preserving the undefeated season? Well, it, it makes it look like a tie isn't really that bad. Yeah, it's great. It's a sense of, look, we still haven't lost. That's a really creative use of language. So these are all examples of good writing. Mr. Jordan, I'm going to ask you to read what is actually great writing, the actual headline of the Harvard Crimson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so good. You're laughing too much to answer. Harvard beats Yale, 29 to 29. What's brilliant about that headline? Uh, it puts a very positive spin on it. It captures the sort of you know, ultimate result of the game. If you were a Harvard fan who knew about the game, you probably did feel like you won, given the, the way that it played out. Exactly. It captures the experience of what it actually felt like to watch that game as a Harvard field. Uh, as a Harvard student. It does all the things Mr. Jordan talked about in terms of advocacy. It is the best words in the best order. One way to think about this is it would be a little weird if it read 29-29, Harvard beats Yale. You kind of have to leave that to the end to have the punchline. It also gets something right in language. As Mr. Jordan said, it describes exactly what it felt like. It doesn't talk in a sort of neutral, descriptive voice about the score, it talks about the experience. And then the final thing is it makes order out of the chaos. Imagine being at this game, 42 seconds of chaos, and then this one headline, you can tell your friends, oh yeah, we beat Yale, 29-29, done. That's brilliant. So Mr. Jordan, do you have any idea who said the best words in the best order? I have no idea. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Defining Poetry. Getting something right in language. Howard Nemiroff, Poet Laureate of the United States, Defining Poetry. Making order out of chaos, every poet ever, including Dr. Seuss, when they're describing poetry. What we're trying to do with this workshop is to get you to think differently about writing, and maybe think a bit poetically, or at least in a literary form, of how can I use language like people who use language well.